Every textbook will tell you how Phineas Gage suffered massive brain damage, which dramatically changed his personality as a result. Today, we're going to uncover the truth about this story and how stories like this get twisted into myths. Stay tuned. You've probably heard the story of Phineas Gage, railroad worker in the 1840s who accidentally blasted an iron rod through his eye and out through the back of his skull, causing massive brain damage to the frontal lobes. It's a miracle he survived such a traumatic injury at a time when doctors still hadn't figured out they needed to wash their hands between patients. The moral of the story, though, is that Gage's personality dramatically changed. He went from likable guy whom everyone loved to a bitter, short-tempered jerk that nobody wanted to be around. According to people who knew him, he was, quote, no longer Gage. One of his doctors went on to conclude that the frontal lobe area's damage must be involved in personality, and thus this case became the cornerstone of neuroscience. Gage's story is featured in almost every introductory psychology textbook and almost any text that discusses the brain and its functions. But as stories become legends, they tend to change, to shift, to exaggerate to better serve their purposes. So how have inaccuracies in this story been used to highlight how the brain influences behavior, in this case, personality? Let's travel back in time to September 13th, 1998. The place is Cavendish, Vermont. The whole town is taken over by a festival full of wonders and activities. A pancake breakfast, a sheep shearing demonstration, a horse and buggy rides, a petting zoo. You could buy a corn dog from the Boy Scouts and go look at a skull with a giant hole in the back. You know, everything you need to party down. They were celebrating the 150th anniversary of Phineas Gage's accident complete with the skull of Gage himself and the tamping iron on loan from Harvard. You could take a railroad ride to the site where the accident happened and go to the doctor's office and other places Gage went on his road to recovery. I only wish I had a time machine so I could go back and set up a booth with little chocolate skulls and candy canes to jam through the eye sockets too much. Probably. But come on, you know they would sell. We have Phineas Gage's skull, generously donated to science by his family after his death. We have the tamping iron, which Gage had carried with him ever since the accident. We have a plaster life mask made of him just after he died. And we even have a photo of Gage with the tamping iron, discovered in 2007 when some antique photo collectors posted a picture of it on Flickr, thinking it was a whaler with a harpoon. One of the commenters suggested it might be Gage, and through comparisons with the life mask, this is generally accepted to be the case. A number of attempts have been made to reconstruct the injury and determine the brain damage using modern scanning techniques, but the best account we have of the injury is from the doctor who first treated Gage. In 1868, a doctor named John Martin Harlow wrote an article that recounted the story of a patient he had seen 20 years previously, the foreman of a rock-blasting gang helping build the railroad, the 25-year-old Phineas Gage. Now keep in mind, we know almost nothing about Gage or the damage done outside of his report, given 20 years after it happened. Though there are a couple of brief papers earlier that focused on the injury without talking much about things like personality or behavior. The doctor opens with a description of Gage as follows. The subject of it was Phineas P. Gage, a perfectly healthy, strong, and active young man, 25 years of age, nervobilious temperament, 5 feet 6 inches in height, average weight, 150 pounds, possessing an iron will as well as an iron frame, muscular system unusually well developed, having had scarcely a day's illness from his childhood to the date of this injury. His physique, will, and capacity of endurance could scarcely be excelled. Jeez, doctor, tone it down a little. Gage had drilled a hole in a rock and was setting the explosives when his three foot seven inch long tamping iron ignited a spark against the rocks which set off the charge and launched its pointy end through his eye, out the top of his skull and high into the air. Now he was knocked to the ground and had convulsions but never went unconscious and within a few minutes was able to speak and move around. His co-workers tossed him in a cart and wheeled him to his hotel where he was seen by Dr. Harlow. He was bleeding a lot, but was able to walk upstairs to his room with a little assistance. 
Every 20 minutes or so, it would throw up a large amount of blood. Uh, the doctor cleaned him up as well as he could. There was no mention of stitches of any kind, but he did puzzle piece the bone back together best he could and slapped on a nightcap and a bandage on there. He also treated the burns on his face and body from the explosion. Gage was lucid and excited to get back to work as soon as possible throughout this whole process. I'll spare you any more of the gory details, but he had about two months of fighting infection. This was before antibiotics, I might add. And after a third month of recovery, he was ready to reapply to get his job back. The doctor then writes this passage about the changes in Gage's mental faculties. His contractors, who regarded him as the most efficient and capable foreman in their employ previous to his injury, considered the change in his mind so marked that they could not give him his place again. The equilibrium or balance, so to speak, between his intellectual faculties and animal propensities seems to have been destroyed. He is fitful, irreverent, indulging at times in the grossest profanity, which was not previously his custom, manifesting but little deference for his fellows, impatient of restraint or advice when it conflicts with his desires, at times pertinaciously obstinate yet capricious and vacillating, devising many plans of future operation, which are no sooner arranged than they are abandoned in turn for others appearing more feasible. A child in his intellectual capacity and manifestations, he has the animal passions of a strong man. Previous to his injury, though untrained in the schools, he possessed a well-balanced mind and was looked upon by those who knew him as a shrewd, smart businessman and very energetic and persistent in executing all of his plans of operation. In this regard, his mind was radically changed so decidedly that his friends and acquaintances said he was no longer Gage. So there you have it, the picture of a manly man's man who, after damage to the frontal lobes, was such an impatient, short-tempered asshole that even the railroad wouldn't hire him to dynamite rocks. The very next paragraph in Harlow's account seems to betray this picture of Gage, however. Years later, the doctor was able to catch up with Gage's mother, who told him the rest of the story. Post-injury, Phineas enjoyed making up daring adventure stories to tell to his nieces and nephews, who intently listened. He had a fondness for animals, horses and dogs. Now this hardly seems to me like a short-fused hothead with attitude problems. A guy who loves to spend as much time as possible with children and animals? I'm thinking that at the time this would have been an activity that the doctor would have deemed unfit for a man's man to do. Waste his time with children and animals. Gage went through a few different jobs right after his injury, but four years post-injury, Gage moved to South America to start up a stagecoach business with a friend in Chile. He stayed there for eight years, caring for horses and driving six-horse teams and running a successful business in the service industry. Stagecoaches were like Uber, but in the 1800s. <laughs> it was, by the way, an extremely competitive business. Does it seem reasonable that someone with those personality changes would be able to move to a foreign country where English isn't the first language and establish a successful person-centered business? As Richard Griggs points out in his 2015 paper on the accuracy of the Gage story in textbooks, controlling each of the six horses individually over steep and rocky terrain would have required complex cognitive abilities and social skills would have to be intact for communicating with non-English speakers. The only other account from a doctor that observed Phineas for a long period of time is Harvard surgeon Henry Bigelow, who reported that Gage was fully recovered, mentally and physically, about a year out from his injuries, and he made no mention of any strange behavior of any kind. Could it be that Harlow had a vested interest in making this case as dramatic as possible, since this is basically the only thing we know this country doctor for? And he knew this was the case that put him on the map. Maybe he was tempted to uh, embellish? The other thing I feel I should mention here is that there's a lot of research around the psychological effects following facial disfiguration injuries. People treat you differently. You may view yourself differently. Eileen Bradbury's 2012 review of the psychological consequences of facial injury says that people with facial disfigurement often report increased social anxiety and avoidance, low mood, feelings of low self-esteem and self-worth, problems with relationships, and difficulties with employment. So maybe Gage did have some irritability, but that doesn't mean it was caused by his brain damage. Maybe he was just experiencing the normal emotions people have when their life takes a sudden unexpected turn. Because he looked different, maybe people treated him differently. 
if you treat someone like they're not the person they used to be, then maybe they become someone different from what they used to be. In any case, I wish this could be a hopeful story about resilience and the chances to recover after a traumatic brain injury. Why can't the books include that in their message? Gage died 12 years after his accident, becoming ill and never quite recovering. Exactly what this illness was or whether it was tied to his injury isn't clear. It's just as likely to have been pneumonia as anything. And remember, doctors at this time were diagnosing patients with things like poorness of blood and bloodletting and, uh, oh yeah, not washing their hands. <laughs> Finally, let's talk about how stories become myths and how textbooks use these stories. Depending on who tells the story, you get slightly different details. Many books specify that the tamping iron was six feet long. Some say that after the accident, he never worked again, or that he became a circus freak show. Uh, these embellishments don't match the facts we do know about the case, but they exaggerate the severity of the injury and the resulting change in behavior like any good folk tale would do. Why does misinformation like this wind up in science textbooks that are supposed to be the most trustworthy sources of information? Because the accuracy of the story becomes secondary to the moral take-home lesson. This happens with many of the classic stories you see in introductory textbooks. Kitty Genovese's attack in broad daylight was witnessed by 38 people and no one called for help. The books tell you this was the basis for the bystander effect. Except that actually we don't know how many witnesses there were and it turns out people did try to help. Little Albert was trained to fear a fuzzy white rat or rabbit or something like that. The details change based on the storyteller, but the morals of that story have shifted over the years too. Originally, the lesson was that fears could be classically conditioned, but now the story is usually paired with an ethics lesson on undoing harm and debriefing. If you read the original article, it isn't so clear that the conditioning was as effective as the stories make it out to be. The Stanford prison experiment wasn't even really an experiment. What was their dependent variable? They didn't seem to be measuring anything. The Milgram experiments had all kinds of problems, the most egregious of which is that the participants often knew that the person in the other room was fake. <laughs> but Milgram's self-interest in launching his career led him to leave out important experiments and mislead everyone about the robustness of his studies. The list goes on and on, and yet year after year, we get professors uncritically telling more and more exaggerated versions of these tales that are corroborated by uncritical accounts in the textbooks. The stories capture the imagination and they help students remember these key concepts we've discovered in psychology. So if it helps teach the lesson, then who cares if the details are correct? Me, I do. I care about things being accurate, and the science textbooks should be held to a higher standard. This bothers the hell out of me. We could use the real story to help people understand a real lesson about science, which is that things aren't always black and white. Often, science has to uncover shades of gray. Scientists are some of the most uncertain people about things that I've ever met. But in the media, a scientist is always portrayed as things are black and white. So the question might not be, uh, whether brain injury causes changes in personality. The question is what kind of changes can happen, how long do they last, and which brain areas are involved. What conditions make people in groups more or less likely to help a stranger in need? Oversimplifying the problem obscures the truth and discourages people from exploring more about these issues. If you'd like me to do in-depth coverage on one of these stories or your favorite story in psychology, leave a comment. Likes and subscribes are always appreciated. And until next time, keep thinking. Am I the only one who thinks they would like post-injury gauge more than pre-injury gauge? And after reading Harlow's descriptions, I bet you're wondering now how your doctor describes you in their patient notes. <laughs>